because this is a kind of a, a general lecture, I thought I'd say something about where I think this whole field is going. In other words, the final frontier of food safety. Uh, where's the next generation of food safety technology is going to come from? And I like this image. This is UCC a week ago. Um, it looks like something out of Mordor or something. It looks like something from uh, Lord of the Rings. Uh, but that's where I worked on in UCC. And if I can switch uh, from fantasy to science fiction for a second, uh, this is the final, where the final frontier uh, thought comes from. That only about 20 or 30 years ago when Star Trek was being written first, I was going to say there were unimaginable technologies, but of course they were able to imagine technologies, but they weren't real technologies. They were envisaging where these technologies would go. And it's amazing how many of them have come true over the last 25 or 30 years. Things like Skype and hands-free systems and 3D printers and mobile phones. And so I think it's um, good to speculate sometimes as to what might come in food safety, even if we don't all have all the technologies together right now. I think it's good to speculate where this field might be going. And the organism I'm going to use is a kind of a, a template for the, the work I'm going to describe is Listeria monocytogenes. We've done a lot of work with Listeria over the last uh, 15 years or so, uh, less so in the last few years, and so some of the references I'll be using are quite old now. But Listeria is still a, an ongoing problem. There's an outbreak in Denmark right now, which has killed 15 people. There are always outbreaks going on, and they kill, unfortunately, 30 to 40 percent of the people who become ill. So it's a rare but often fatal illness. It infects very vulnerable people in the population, particularly people who are immunocompromised, um, associated with a whole range of different foods, including now uh, melons more commonly as well. And we're interested in it because of the, these things, of course, but also because it's a very hardy organism, a very tough organism. It can survive quite high heat, high salt, low acid or low pH, um, withstand high pressures, and also because there's quite a bit of regulatory confusion. In the EU, there are 100 CFU per gram permitted in some foods and zero in other foods. And I, I've always liked that 100 CFU per gram because it suggests that 99 CFU per gram is completely safe, but 101 CFU per gram is dangerous. But of course, when I've talked to some of the regulators, the reason it's 100 is because 10 seemed a bit too low and 1,000 seemed a bit high, so 100. But that seems to be the logic behind it. We can permit some listeria, but not many. And the reason for that is that, again, the rareness of it and the fact that it only uh, affects certain people. Now, in the US, they have zero tolerance for listeria, but they have the same levels of listeriosis as we do in Europe. So that doesn't seem to have uh, changed the, the problem. And what I always like about food safety, too, is it's a very complicated area. It's very difficult to predict what's going to happen when an individual eats a food contaminated with a pathogen. I think everybody's gone through the routine of, well, it couldn't have been the chicken because Mary had the chicken and she didn't get sick, but Johnny had the chicken, but then he didn't have the soup, and, and all this kind of trying to work out afterwards what may have been responsible for foodborne disease. But in fact, when a host meets a microbe suspended in a particular food, virtually any outcome is possible. And we're not really in a good place to predict what that outcome is going to be. We're missing variables, and that's what I want to focus on in this talk. So, we all know that microbial numbers are important and regulations very often focus on microbial numbers. We know the health and the age of the host is important and very often the regulations will have built into them. If this food is aimed at infants, then the regulations are different. If it's aimed at sick people, the regulations are different. We know that the food type is important and particularly ready to eat foods may have a different set of regulations to foods that will be processed before you eat them. Even though that's not always successful, for example, there was a hot dog outbreak in the US of listeria a few years back, and these were frozen hot dogs which had to be boiled or baked or cooked in some way before you ate them. But people were falling sick with listeria, and when they did an investigation after, it turned out on very hot days, some people were taking frozen hot dogs from the fridge and eating them the way we'd eat an ice lol or an ice cream, just to cool off a bit. So even foods which you might think are going to be handled in a particular way, you don't know how they're going to be handled. So what I'm asking are, given that the regulations are based on managing these kind of variables, numbers, health, age, food types, so you see here if the listeria regulations, ready to eat foods for infants, so health and age, or medical purposes, then the, the regulation is no bacteria. 
but ready to eat foods able to support the growth of listeria, 100 CFU if you can show listeria can't grow, absence if it can grow, ready to eat foods only, again you're back up to 100, so the regulations look very complicated, but it's an attempt to give producers a chance to produce food and yet um, not punish the producer but protect the consumer. But we obviously don't have enough here to predict what's going to happen if a pregnant woman eats a food with 100 CFU per gram. We just don't know what's going to happen in that instance. So I think there are a lot of variables missing on all three arms of this kind of triangle. And what I want to do is try and fill in some of these in the next few minutes. We do a lot of work on the microbiota. So I was bound to bring the microbiota back into it. But the microbiota, I think, is definitely a player in how sensitive you are to a particular infection or not. Here's a, an experiment that I really like, done in the 50s, and I doubt it'll ever be done again. Uh, this was deliberately feeding prisoners salmonella in milk at different levels, and then looking at the outcome. Of course, the outcome is well, how ill they got and how sick they became. And even here, where nearly every variable is controlled. The strain was controlled, the numbers, the food type, the health and age of the host, all healthy males, all between 20 and 50 years of age and so on. None of them were coerced. They all got time off their sentence if they volunteered, apparently. And what you see is that if you give all these prisoners 1,000 salmonella, nobody gets ill. But if you give them 100,000, about 25% of the prisoners became ill. But why didn't the other 75% become ill? And when you gave them a billion salmonella, there were still 15% of people who didn't become ill. So what's different about these people? Host factors, immune status, but also maybe the microbiota. Our microbiotas are all different. And here's just one experiment using listeria. This was done by Sinead Carr in our lab a, a few years ago. And in this experiment, here's listeria. It's light-emitting listeria. We engineered listeria to emit light, so it's uh, lux tagged. And you can see light through uh, flesh. It's quite easy to see through flesh. So these listeria are being viewed through the body of a living mouse by a very powerful camera. And you can see that this mouse was fed listeria. There's the listeria in the gut, uh, 30 minutes after being fed. This mouse has its microbiota altered by one single bacterium. We've fed that mouse one bacteria that this mouse does not have, and this mouse is now completely protected. It's protected because that particular bacterium produces a compound that kills listeria. If we eliminate that property so it no longer kills listeria, then it no longer protects the mouse. So you can bring it down to the microbiota or even down to a single bacterium or even one property of one bacterium. These mice on either end will die as a result of this infection. This mouse doesn't even know it's been infected. So a pause up, pause down outcome with one bacteria difference. So the microbiota I think is important, but it's difficult for us to do much about that unless you want to just eat this bacterium all the time. So the microbiota I think plays a role. What about the stress history of the bacterium? What about where the bacteria is coming from? Not just where it is in the food, but where did it come from? What's its previous history? This is an experiment that we did with Breed O'Driscoll back 20 years ago now, nearly 17 years ago. And what she showed was that if you took Listeria and exposed it to low pH, this is pH 3.5, so we grew it at pH 7, shifted it to pH 3.5, six, seven logs a kill, uh, within, that should be minutes actually, that's within 60 minutes, within an hour you get this very rapid kill. But if you shift it to pH 5 for 30 minutes and then to pH 3.5, it survives almost perfectly. So it's been adapted. It's seen the advent, I, I shouldn't be imparting intelligence to bacterium, but it's seen conditions change, pH is dropping, it switches on genes and systems to protect itself, and they work then at the lower pH. You might say, so what? You know, that's a, an interesting trick, but does that play any role in food? Well, here's the, if we take that uh, bacterium and either stress it or don't stress it and then put it straight into a low pH food like yogurt or cottage cheese or, or regular cheese, then you can see that even one day later, there's a five log difference. Here you've got a three and a half log difference eight days later. So eight days after getting a half hour pulse at pH 5.5, the bacterium is surviving. So the adaptation was switched on in 30 minutes, but it's still effective eight days later. In fact, it's still effective here a month later and here a month later. Logs of difference. So the bacterium survives if 
it's been stressed, it doesn't survive if it hasn't been stressed, but some of our regulations are based on does listeria survive in the food? Well, it does or it doesn't, but it's the same bacteria. Also, this makes a big role in, or has a big role to play in virulence. Here's a mouse experiment. There's a thousand-fold difference in virulence between a bacterium, a mutant that we made which cannot switch on its acid tolerance genes, and one which has it permanently switched on. Thousand-fold difference. In fact, we autoclaved that strain. We decided we don't want to have a strain of listeria on the lab that is a thousand times more virulent than normal listeria. So don't bother asking for it, it's gone. So stress history, microbiota, what about the processing? Now it's linked to stress history, of course. What processing steps has the food received? And how does that prepare the organism for subsequent growth, survival, or inf infection? What we found was that if you pre-treat with acid, then you get resistance to acid. I just showed you that. But the same happens with salt to salt, heat to heat, antimicrobial peptides, pressure. We never really tested uh, pressure for technological reasons, whether pressure protects against pressure, because, of course, you have to relieve the pressure, and that takes a lot of time before you can retest. What we also found, though, was that acid not only protects against acid, it also protects against salt, heat, and antimicrobial peptides. Salt not only protects against salt, but also against heat and pressure, but not against acid. So there's a kind of a hierarchy of stresses. If you expose something to acid, you render it resistant to lots of other stresses. But if you come the other way, if you expose it first to heat, then to salt, and then to acid, you get the maximum impact of all three stresses. You go the other way around, you get only the impact of the first stress. So the sequencing of steps, of processing steps, is going to be very important for the food industry, particularly in minimally processed food. This is work done by Willem van Schaik in our lab uh, quite some time ago. And here's an example of that. Here's salt strains, uh, listeria grown in 0% salt or in 3% salt, and then exposed to pressure, 5 megapascals for 5 minutes. You see 6, 7 logs a kill for the normal strain, if you like, and only 1 log of kill for the strain that was grown in the presence of salt. The salt has stressed the bacterium and rendered it resistant to uh, pressure subsequently. That's my vision of what a bacteria under pressure looks like. <laughs> so we've got stress history, we've got microbiota, we've got processing. What about the individual constituents or ingredients in the food? Do we need to take that into account? And here's the same graph I just showed you a second ago, but now I'll extend it by showing you what happened in a mutant which we made, which Roy Slater made in the lab, where he showed that these three uh, genes here encode the ability of listeria to take up compatible solutes. Compatible solutes like glycine, uh, betaine or carnitine from the food. If you knock out the ability to take up glycine, betaine and carnitine, then it doesn't matter whether you grow in salt or not, they're equally sensitive to pressure. So the resistance to pressure depends on the availability of glycine, betaine or carnitine in the food. So the constituents of the food play an important role as well. And here's another example of that. We, uh, Paul Cotter in the lab, he looked at this acid tolerance mechanism and he focused in on this very important system, the GAD system. And what he showed was that the GAD system is a system where glutamate is taken out of the environment. This is a, a low pH environment. Protons are diffusing into the cytoplasm and they're going to acidify the cytoplasm and kill the cell. Instead, what the cell does is it takes up glutamate, it converts glutamate to GABA, gamma aminobutyric acid, and in the process it consumes a proton and produces carbon dioxide and then it exports the GABA for another molecule of glutamate. So the net result is that glutamate is essentially converted to GABA outside the cell, but a proton is consumed inside the cell. So it just keeps spinning around and hoovers up the protons which are coming into the cell and protects the cell against uh, acid uh, kill, but only in the presence of glutamate. Here's the exposure of listeria to porcine stomach juice, so we got stomach juice from a pig that had just been slaughtered. Uh, it's a very good mimic for human stomach juice. We introduced listeria, and within 20 minutes, you got seven or eight logs a kill. So why should we worry about listeria in food? The acid barrier of the stomach is a perfect protection against listeria. But if we add 10 millimolar glutamate, listeria swims through the acid bath of the stomach completely unaffected. Now the acid has no effect on listeria. So this is going to have a major effect on the potential virulence of a strain, whether it's able to use glutamate like this or not. 
And also we showed that if you look at glutamate or GAD activity, when you take a strain that has very low GAD activity, and when you shift it to pH 5, it immediately switches on its GAD genes, and that's one of the mechanisms then by which it becomes acid tolerant. So they're all linked together. Here again are strains. This time we made a mutant which can't use glutamate. If you can't use glutamate, you die very quickly in all these acidic foods, but if you can use glutamate, you survive very well in all these acidic foods. And all these foods have naturally high levels of glutamate, you can see here, listed as well as naturally low pHs. So the ability to use glutamate gives you the ability to survive or not in a food. So constituents, processing, microbiota, stress history. What about strain variability, strain to strain variability? Is that another issue we should consider? And as an example, let me use switch organisms to E. coli. E. coli runs the gamut from being a probiotic. There's a probiotic called Mutaflor, E. coli Nissel 1917, and that is good for people with IBS and asthma and eczema. And then, of course, there's 0157H7, which is a very dangerous pathogen. And E. coli has members which kind of cross from being good for you to being bad for you, mildly bad for you, maybe harmless, and all the way through. And we don't really have any difficulty discriminating between these. The Food Safety Authority would prosecute you if you had 10 0157H7 in your food, and they would prosecute you if you had less than 10 to the 9 probiotic bacteria in your product. So we find it quite easy with E. coli to say, well, some strains, one regulation, other strains. We don't do that for many other strains but our species, but maybe we should. And as a historical footnote, the earliest patient to be treated with this particular probiotic was Hitler. And it's very well documented, he had IBS, he had eczema, he was treated with this probiotic, and he was so impressed by the results that he made the physician who prescribed it his personal physician uh, for the rest of his life. Now it's maybe a shame he didn't get this one rather than that one, but <laughs> we can leave that to, to history. But in terms of strain variability, some strains, and this is work done uh, largely by Sheila Ryan in the lab, Maura Begley, she showed that some strains, all strains have at least one GAD system, every listeria we looked at, but some strains had two GAD systems. And the second GAD was encoded on this genetic island, what we call the SSI1, Stress Survival Island 1, because these are the GAD genes, but these other genes are also involved in resistance to, to other stresses. I won't go into it now. So it's a Stress Survival Island. So some strains of one, some strains of two. And what uh, Sheila did was she knocked out the Stress Survival Island in a strain, she, so she generated a, a, a non or an isogenic strain that didn't have the stress survival island. And what you see, again, using the light as a trick here, in soft cheese, the strain with the island can grow really well. And there you see it growing in the cheese just under the rind where you expect to find it. And there you see it again growing reasonably well. But if, you don't, if it doesn't have the island, it cannot grow. And in fact, it dies off. So again, if you're asked, as a man manufacturer, I make soft cheese, does Listeria grow or not in your soft cheese? You'd say, Yes and no. It depends on which strain you're using, whether it has this island or not. So it's not just a, a, an easy answer, even though the regulators might, might think it is at times. In stress, strain variability and virulence, this is work largely done by Paul Cotter in the group. This was a study that came out in about 2004, and they made the point that the strains that are normally involved in epidemics of listeria are normally 4B strains. The strains that are found in food and in the environment and don't cause epidemics are generally lineage two and three. And when you look at the genomes of those different types of strains, there are only 51 genes that are unique to the four Bs. And so we went through those 51 genes in turn to see what, whether we could find anything there. And Paul found this another island, in this case a virulence island, not a stress island. No four Bs had this, but two thirds, or no non four Bs had it, but two thirds of four B strains had this island. And through some very clever work that I don't have time to go into, Paul was able to show that this encodes a second hemolysin, a second toxin in E. coli. And he was also able to show that that toxin made the strains more virulent in mouse models and also in human uh, cell lines. So this is an extra virulence factor that only some listeria have. This led us to, to question, could there be food strains and disease strains? Food strains might have the island. They'd grow well in food, 
but they don't have a second homolysin, they're less virulent, and maybe a lot of the foods that we're withdrawing from the market because they contain listeria have this one. But this, the disease strains grow very poorly in food. They don't have the island, but they have the second homolysin. They're much more virulent. These are probably the ones we should be regulating against rather than these. I'm simplifying it to make a point, but uh, you get the, the point I'm ma making, I hope. So we went looking to see if this was validate, if we could validate this. And when we did a 35 strain study of listeria isolated from different environments, from humans, from cheese, from silage, and from animals, what we found, we could only find one strain that had both islands. Most strains had the stress survival island, some strains had the virulence island. What was interesting was the ones in bold here and in red are the ones from epidemics. And all four epidemic strains we had in this survey all had this extra hemolysin. And only one of them had the stress survival island. So just last week, I went back because now there are lots of listeria genomes have been sequenced, nearly 100. And what I did was I went back and I screened for the presence of these islands. All of these strains contain this island. All of these ones contain this island. There's not a single one that contains both islands. So listeria does seem to split, at least on this analysis, into two groups. You're either able to grow well in food and you're quite hardy and one of the other stress survival islands actually makes it so you can grow pretty well in the gut. These ones don't grow well in food or in the gut but they're much more virulent when they get into a human. So lots of extra variables but so what? How can we deal with this? This might be fall under the interesting but useless kind of category. So what? But I think we can actually take advantage of this. This is the Star Trek bit of looking to the future I think what we'll end up doing, what the final frontier for food safety is, and we're nearly there. We can do this now, but it's just too expensive to do it uh, routinely. What we'll do is we'll take food, we'll extract DNA and RNA from that food, and we'll sequence it. This is becoming very, very cheap to do. We do this now for gut samples all the time. It's nearly down to about 20, 25 euro to sequence millions, hundreds of millions of individual sequences. You then do the bioinformatics on that, and if you just look at the 16S signatures, then you get a complete quantitative microbial profile. Every bacterium in there without having to grow them, without having to enrich for them, without having to look for them. We get bacterial, viral, fungal. We get an impression of how quickly that food is going to spoil. We find out what other bacteria are present, and obviously we'll find any pathogens that are present. And what that will give us is a quantitative risk assessment. It'll also give us epidemiological certainty. You'll have the sequence of these strains, not just listeria is there and listeria is there, you'll have the actual sequence. So you know whether the same strain or different strains, how many different listeria are present. You'll also, if you do a total DNA sequencing run, you get a gene-based risk assessment. What islands are present? Pathogenicity islands, survival islands, what metabolic potential do they have? Do they have the ability to take up compatible solutes, take up glutamate and so on? You could also do an RNA prep and sequence the RNA. Again, that's uh, quite doable, even though a bit more expensive. And that will give you viability assessment. It'll tell you what the strain history is. Have the GAD genes been switched on? Have the salt tolerance genes been switched on? Have the heat genes, the grow genes been switched on? So it'll tell you the stress adaptation status. It'll give you therapeutic options because, of course, you'll, you'll have as a, at, a, at your fingertips whether the bacteria are resistant to any antibiotics or not. Uh, what antibiotics are most likely to work. You obviously find any emerging pathogens that we can't currently cultivate. You just see them there by their sequence signatures. And this is getting very rapid. So we are getting to the point where Bones or whatever his name was on Star Trek used to come up with a little machine and just hold it up to someone and then tell them what they were sick from or what the, the treatment was going to be. I think we're getting close to the point where we'll take a sample of food and within a matter of hours we'll have all of these readouts with no microbiology in the middle, no culturing, uh, and tremendous certainty as to the real risk of a particular food. Might be, have high levels of listeria and be completely safe. Might have low levels of listeria and be incredibly dangerous. We've done a very quick kind of um, pre-run of this. You can't read that. But this is a, we took infant milk formula and we did the normal culture dependent. We played it on every agar we could think of picked every colony we could find and did a 16S in it to find out what it was. And we got this list of bacteria which are present in the infant milk formula. And 
quite worryingly, in there was a Cronobacter Sakazaki. So we found Cronobacter in this infant milk formula, and we found all these other things, bacilli, uh, Brevi bacilli, Enterobacter, and so on, ish, E. coli even in there. And what we did uh, in parallel to this, we, we took the same sample, rehydrated it, and did a complete DNA prep, and then looked at the 16S with non-culture independent. Then we got a big list. I won't do the comparators, but we found lots of bacteria by sequencing that we did not find by culturing. But interesting, we did pick up the same Cronobacter. So the technique worked equally well in finding the danger organism in there, but it gave us a very different picture of what was in there to what we got from the culturing. So I think this is the future for uh, food safety. So in conclusion, to predict the risk associated with pathogen host food interactions, we do need to know something about the host age and health. The microbiota, I can't figure out yet how to uh, pitch into this. You can get your own microbiota done if you like for $100. Take a fecal specimen, send it to um, a lab in, in the States, and they'll send you back your microbiota profile. It's called the, the Gut Project in, in the States. Uh, they're setting up another one in Europe. So knowing your own microbiota will be relatively trivial fairly soon. What you do about it is going to be a different issue. But in addition to knowing the numbers of the bacterium and simply the identity of the level of Listeria monocytogenes or E. coli or Salmonella and Terica, I think we'll need to know the genetic complement of the strain, the growth, survival, virulence potential, the previous history of the strain, how is it likely to behave when it hits the gut, when it hits the um, GI tract, and the food type, not only whether it's ready to eat or not, but what was its processing history? What constituents does it have? In what order were the processing steps applied? What about co-consumed foods? What if you say, I'll be careful not to eat any food containing glutamate because listeria can use the glutamate. But what if you eat the food with no glutamate but drink some tomato juice at the same time, which is full of glutamate? So what about co-consumption of foods? Can we get cross uh, protection from one food to another? It should inform policy, I think, but how? Uh, I think we will end up, as we do already for E. coli, having specific regulations, not at the species level, but at the strain level. We'll actually discriminate between different Listeria, different E. coli, different Salmonella, as we currently do for E. coli. We'll have specific regulations for specific foods. Should we have zero tolerance for Listeria in high glutamate foods? Glutamate protects Listeria through the stomach. Absolutely. And so low levels of listeria in a glutamate food is probably more dangerous than high levels of listeria in a non-glutamate containing food. What about the sequencing of processing steps for minimal processing? Should we advise people on how to, to uh, phase those processing such that you don't render the strain resistant with the first step and then uh, eliminate the efficacy of the second and third and fourth steps? And do we need specific regulations and advice for high risk groups? Do we need to actually say to people in hospital, don't drink tomato juice if you're eating soft cheese or something that might have listeria? Uh, are there certain combinations we need to avoid in very high risk groups? These are all Star trek -y kind of pushing out into the future, but this is where food safety, I think, has to go. We have to take on this challenge. And I suspect that within the next decade or so, we will see this as being um, so obvious that it doesn't even uh, warrant a mention. So, the future begins here, and I challenge all of you involved in food safety to uh, jump on board this challenge and look at ways that we can better improve these uh, missing variables and better uh, assist in protecting the health of consumers. I'd like to thank the Listeria Research Group in UCC, particularly Cormac, uh, who have soldiered with on Listeria for, for 10 or 15 years. And then these are the people who did the work that I actually presented uh, today, and I, so I thank them thank the funders, and of course, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much.